This classic episode of the Electric Playground is brought to you by PNP Games, your source for everything video games. Support the partners that support Electric Playground. Remember, this episode first aired in 1997. Hey, Dad. What? <laughs> what do we got on the show this week? What, the electronic playground? The electric playground. Yeah, whatever it is. Uh, you're going to be talking to your screwball friend, Doug Tenaple, and they're going to be doing something with Steven Spielberg on this lost Jurassic World part, and you're going to be talking about that new racing game, Nintendo Ding Dong King Kong, <laughs> what the heck ever it is. Diddy Kong. What? Diddy Kong. Yeah, okay. Goodbye. Leave me alone. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tommy Tellerico. I've been writing music for video games for over seven years now, and I gotta tell you, it is one of the coolest industries on the entire planet. Now we're gonna take you inside the world of video games, like no one else has ever done before. Now throw in weekly reviews of the hottest new games, and you got what we call the Electric Playground. The big question is, Diddy Kong Racing, Mario Kart 64 clone, or something a little more? We went to Nintendo to find out. What is different about this game from other cartoon racers that Nintendo has put out before? It's kind of an adventure racing, wave race meets some airplane racing, and then the multiplayer aspect is, you know, just as amazing as what we have in Golden. Is this the most ambitious Nintendo 64 game produced so far, do you think? Uh, yes. Yes, I mean, they packed a lot. I mean, it's it's a lot more than what you think it is at face value. You see a screenshot, you think, oh, kart racing game or, or boat racing game or plane racing game. But it's a lot more than just those three things put together. The way the adventure mode is set up in, in Diddy Kong Racing allows the player much more feeling of the exploration, somewhat like you got in Mario 64. And then when you go actually race on the tracks, you feel like, oh, it's a racing game, cool, I, I understand this. Then all of a sudden you find that you're racing and you have to grab these silver coins. And then you find that now you're racing a boss and it's not some funky looking guy in a car, it's a huge triceratops racing you up a spiral mountain or a big walrus and you're racing down this giant ice half pipe. And, and as you're beating these guys, they're opening up more and more of the game so that you end up finding all over this overworld all these different racetracks. And just by finding all those, then you get to do these things which will take you to secret areas. And I mean, the game really does combine what has been traditionally thought of as platformer adventure aspects into a racing game. One of the cooler things about this game is this technology that Rare basically invented, which they call uh, real-time dynamic an animation. They've written this code so that they can do a lot more polygons on the screen than was thought possible. Basically stuff the screen with skinned polygons that are all dynamically animating, which means if I run into a wall or something, you'll see them kind of shake, and it's based literally on their inertia. It's called uh, inverse kinematics. The airplanes include specular highlighting, and a lot of the vehicles as well as the characters, for example, Diddy Kong's hat is environment mapped. This is another thing that the, the rare technology allows them to do is you know, it's, you can do environment mapping, obviously, and specular highlighting on the Nintendo 64, but trying to do it with eight characters on the screen in a big giant world is a whole nother animal. You actually have the ability in this game to race one player as a plane, one player as a hovercraft, two people as the cart. You know, any combination, whatever you want to do. The music is coming off the cartridge on the fly, so you're able to actually change the song anytime you want. Now, if I can hit both these zippers, I will maybe win. Oh, yes! Diddy Kong Racing appearing, quote, out of nowhere is something I think that will be seen more as the Nintendo 64 ages. But all it really is is a return to the way that Nintendo was in the 16-bit era of telling the public about the game when we think the game is ready to ship. After this, we run with the dinosaurs of the Lost World. Hey Trevor, I just picked a puzzle fighter from PNP Games. You can be Dan. What? I'll be right down. Just making some gamer broccoli.
DreamWorks Interactive have been hard at work letting Spielberg's digital dinos run wild on the Saturn. We are here at DreamWorks Interactive with Patrick Gilmore, the producer for The Lost World. Tell me quickly, what is Jurassic Park the game about? What do you do? Uh, well, The Lost World, you play a series of five characters in an environment of escalating chaos, which is what we like to call the island environment, which sort of erupts in the chaos with the arrival of mankind. The thing. What? The thing came off. Ah! What involvement did Steven Spielberg have with with the game? Well, he was very, very involved from the from the absolute outset on this project, from the time when the game was just a, a bunch of fragmented ideas on 3x5 note cards. And his concepts for the game uh, were integrated very early on, his concepts for the different characters, how the characters would be controlled and how they'd be handled, how sound would function in the game and, and what its role would be, the role of music in the game, how the game would flow in general, from everything from sort of the cinematic camera angles to to how the story was told through not just one character, but through five separate characters. And we actually saw them sculpting a whole canyon made of styrofoam and painting it and, and adding all the textures and plants and things to it. And it was sort of looked at it and thought, wow, you know, we do the same thing except for in polygons. How, how do you animate something that you've never actually seen before? Like a dinosaur, you've never, you can't go to a zoo and see a dinosaur. What, what exactly, how do you do that? Based on some of the, some natural references, which happens to be the bones itself. So the bones of the structures, exactly. you know, kind of the joints right. and stuff. Yeah, everything, like things like uh, the distance between the, in the thigh bone, the relation between the thigh bone and the shin bone. Uh -huh. uh, did, you, did, did you break that? You shouldn't, shouldn't have broken yeah, that. Yeah, uh, actually, the, yes, the, the length of the shin, the length of uh, right. the thigh, everything determines how the dinosaur might have moved. In fact, one of the most classic examples that I can say is the, uh, how we determine how uh, a Deinonychus might move. Now that's a dinosaur with a very stiff tail. Mm -hmm. So we didn't know how that might have influenced the, the dinosaur. At that point, around that time, I found myself running after a bus, after a Los Angeles empty a bus. Which many people usually yeah. do. With somebody chasing you? I was running around with, with, this, uh, with, a back, with a very heavy backpack. Mm -hmm. And I found something very interesting happening. I found the backpack to be influencing my, the, the movement. So I found that if I tilted the backpack just to the right, I found myself uh, changing direction drastically. So now you have a dinosaur, a, a Deinonychus, which moves, which uh, moves real fast uh, by the aid of its tail by simply whipping the tail as a rudder. The Lost World is sort of, it has as its goal to sort of create a linear narrative that is that is there for the player to experience. And this is available for both the Sony PlayStation and the Sega Saturn. Available for PlayStation and for Sega Saturn. Well, thank you, Sunil, for bringing the long dead to life. Check it out, Lost World from DreamWorks Interactive. Hi, you're watching the Electric Playground, and I'm here with Joe Satriani. That's me, hello. And Steve Vai. That's me. And I wanted to ask you guys about the F1 game. So they managed to get some of your tracks from that? Yeah, they were developing the game a couple of years ago and they contacted me and a number of other artists about uh, putting together music for this. So I saw, you know, six or seven beta versions of it. It looked like a lot of fun. And uh, just threw a bunch of songs at them and they, they took the ones they wanted to use. Did you guys work on it together or did they take separate tracks from you? Uh, well, no, we had the music already recorded, right. and we're Sony artists, so they kind of um, listened, listened for what was right for the game. And the songs are real up-tempo and driving, just like, just like the game. And I had, um, I had received a copy, and I'm not, I, I didn't really uh, get a chance to play, it, play with it, so I gave it to my son, who is a video game savant. Oh, yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and he gave it the big thumbs up, so I said, okay, let's go for it. <laughs> are you guys gearheads? This is the big question. Sure, you have to be. Guitar players are, yeah, born gearheads, you know, computers, guitars, you name it, cars, motorcycles, anything you can fiddle with or into it <laughs> with power behind it. Do you have enhanced CDs? Well, I've got a couple of computers at home, and I've, people have sent me these uh, enhanced CDs to play, to check out. You stick them in one computer, it doesn't work. Stick them in the other, it doesn't work. And, yeah, and you keep finding different ones work on different ones. So I'm not convinced yet that... I should spend my money producing one of those instead of producing an album. If you're working within the perfect format and you have one and it works in your computer, it's, it's cool. It's just, it's just that you know somebody's breaking the ice. 
So, you know, things are, will open up and eventually it'll be a real nice, interesting format for kids or whoever, you know, music lovers to get on there and take their CD and or DVD or whatever, you know. Now, a video game is very much like an interactive movie. And so would you consider scoring one that had, because it can, it can evoke so much emotion from happy to sad to fear. Would you be interested in doing something like that? I'd love to do that. I know there are some, I don't know if you'd call them games. They're like worlds out there. The worlds are populated by thousands of characters who log on. I'm interested in creating music for something like that. Not for like a, you know, drive it up fast, shoot them up fast kind of a game. So who, who would you like to approach you to do this? Whoever has the most money. I think Bill Gates. Bill, if you're out there watching, come on over to my house. It's a modest little place. But, uh, yeah, we could have fun. I could convince you to give me some of your money. And I'd make this great soundtrack to some virtual world for you. You can sell that place in Redmond and live inside the computer. Coming up after the break, Doug Tenaples shows us around the neighborhood. How to use one of these? Goldeneye, load a rumble pack and see how it feels when 007 meets N64. You know, I've met a lot of people in this industry, but no one is as zany as Doug Tenable. So let's catch a lift on Mr. Tenaple's wild ride as he takes us on a tour of his somewhat unbalanced studio. Hi, I'm Doug Tenaple, and we're showing you a bunch of animated techniques we used on the Neverhood and our brand new game called Skull Monkeys. I am the king of all skull monkeys. This is my desk and I keep it a mess, thank you, because my mom doesn't work here with me. This is uh, one of the skull monkey puppets and we have real human hair on them. Many humans gave their lives so that this monkey might come to be. This is one of the heroes, one of our little claimanites, and he has a wire armature and these are painstakingly sculpted uh, across a period of about two months. They each cost about 15 grand to sculpt. I'm gonna set him down over here. This shows how poseable he is. Yeah, you sit on the couch there. Okay. What's that guy? This is one of our other puppets. His name is the Weasel. Hey, Doug. Oh, well, hey, Tom. How's it going, man? Tommy, get, hey. get up. Hey, what? What's look, look, look. What? What? Come on. I'm going to show you some of the programmers. Follow me. This is Kenton. And he's one of our big, uh, one of our heavy programmers. He weighs about 400 pounds. This is Mark Lorenzen. He's the original creator of Vector Man. This is Joe. He's one of our game designers. And he used to run a 7 program. <laughs> no, Joe is actually the first human we've ever put in a video game. We photographed his head as one of the bosses called Joe Head Joe. And uh, he designed some of the puzzles. Ow! He designed the puzzles that Clayman actually has to traverse to the game. This is our game, a uh, rough version of it anyways, to test. And uh, you see Clayman, he butt bounces these evil skull monkeys. They're monkeys with human skulls for heads. We, uh, we pull from toys, this is our toy box. We steal these toys and nail them to wood and cover them in clay. And you get these cool abstract shapes. Tommy, what do I say about touching things? That's a no. This is Monk Rushmore. This is our uh, tribute to all the great uh, dead Skull Monkey presidents. This is our whiteboard where we keep all of our ideas and organization, as you can see. Hardly any ideas and hardly any organization here at all. This is Mike Dietz. Mike is the, uh, the, the lead animator. Uh, he was also the lead animator on Earthworm Jim 1 and 2, and Aladdin, and Global Gladiators, and Cool Spot, and many others to name a couple others. This is Chuck Norris. Chuck is inventing uh, time travel. He's invented this coding way of going through time. It's really amazing. Tommy, get your pants back on. 
Fat Lou gets all pissed off. He'll come over and punch you out. Sorry, Fat Lou. Lou, show your tattoos you got in prison. Doug's mom did all the work. <laughs> This is our pet scorpion that Lou here is going to handle. Okay, if I touch his pincher, will I be a man? No! And she does cool things when you put uh, fluorescent light on her, she glows. See that? Yeah. Is that boss or what? Lewis is in charge of our actual game test department and he tells all of the people on the team when they're doing something wrong, which is like every second of the day. Awesome. What's the big bug? Uh, come out to the warehouse, because there's some cool stuff to see out here. It's cool visuals. Tommy, bring your guitar here. It's better acoustics. Let me show you some of the other puppets and characters that are here at the Neverhood. This is one of the big monsters. Come around here, there's a little bit more light. There! This guy's one of the, the main bad guys, and this shows how we can move him one frame at a time. Open and close the mouth. This is one of the evil skull monkeys that chases Clayman around the planet. <sighs> one frame at a time, you're in hell. This is the, probably the most valuable player on the entire team, the Makita Drill. This is the cool uh, crystal wand that we all have, uh, we worship every day. This is kind of our little cult we have going here. We stockpile firearms upstairs. Um, and it's all for the great wand. It's whatever it wants us to do. Whatever it wants us to do. That was nice. This is the chip butty, which our English friends will appreciate, the french fry sandwich. Um, only the English could come up with something as wonderful of a recipe as the chip butty, the french fry sandwich. Fine cuisine over there, I understand. Mm. This house is kind of broken out in sores, which happens if you take a chip butty and like rub it all over your face, the next day you get some of this effect. This is the evil wizard. All this little garment blows in the breeze in the game. Another cool puppet. This is El Barfo, the monkey that throws himself up inside out. This is Clayman in a little ship. He's all clay, his little hair moves. This is what the Eats skeleton looks like. This is the armature that goes underneath the clay. You can move it a little bit, and they're all metal, ball and socket, and covered in clay. This is Headless Willie. He's a crazy man. Crazy. Has no head, has no hands either because they say that he bit his own hands off right before he bit his own head off. Crazy. And this is how we let the little people out of our head. Crazy. Oh, cool! Look, it's Earthworm! Yeah, Man, this is careful. so cool! Look at this thing! Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, we'll just, we'll put some kind of... Jeez, this will be okay. We're just gonna put it... Where That's it. Kinda... Get out. He's going out. But wait, no, no, I don't think so. Here with oh, geez, ow. Like, but, hey, Doug, Doug, well, I'll see you later, Doug. You come back and I'll call the cops. Okay. I'm calling the cops. Stick around, EP's reviews on the run are next. Past and Present Games is a Winnipeg-based independent business with three retail locations. But you can shop on the World Wide Web at pmpgamesonline.com, where coupon code STARFOX64 will save you $5 on your purchase of 100 or more until April 12th. We'll see you next week. Now enjoy Reviews on the Run. Heat.net is an internet game network that lets you play against live competition, multiplayer games against a million people in some games. A million people. Well, in 10-6, which is the first million player game that's yep. coming, only for Heat.net, um, you can play against 999,999 friends. Anyone can sit at home and play and there's, a, there's always a place for that, by yourself against the computer. Uh, but when you do that, it's, it's more mission-based and it's, it's just sort of testing yourself against the computer and the artificial intelligence. And uh, as we like to say here, he, artificial intelligence is an oxymoron. Porsche Challenge for the PlayStation. Porsche Challenge. If you love racing games and you like racing games, I'd say definitely pick this one up. The, uh, the graphics are above average. The control is real easy. Uh, I love the music and the sound effects were excellent. It's uh, definitely above average. Um, 
I, I didn't like the two-player mode. It was hard to see the track where you were going. Um, I don't like the fact that all the characters, there were like all these characters, like there's Beats and Dan and, you know, don't give me that. Give me, give me, it's this Porsche Challenge. I want a 911 and a 356 or a 959. There's only one car, but lots of characters. All very good points. Yeah, I, I mean, I give it a 7.8. I think it's a, a very good above average driving game. I definitely play it again. Um, you know, I, I liked it. I don't think it's the best one out there, but I've played a lot worse. Yeah. The thing is, is there's so many great driving games for the PlayStation. Yes. Yeah. It's loaded with games that beat it. I, I like Rallycross way better than, than Porsche Challenge. Um, the graphics are cool. It's great that it's got the Boxster in it. The Boxster is an incredible car. It's even got the uh, Porsche dealerships at the end of yeah. the uh, instruction book. That's pretty neat. Yeah. But uh, there's not enough stuff in it to make you want to go out and buy it, if, especially if you've already got a few driving games in your collection. I'd give it a 7 out of 10. It's a mediocre title at best. Fighter's Mega Mix for the Saturn. If you're going to buy any fighting game for the Saturn, buy Fighter's Mega Mix. It's got all the characters. It's got all the virtual fighter characters. It's got all the fighting viper characters. It's even got some some weird characters from, from all every other Sega game in the world. Can you play Sonic the Hedgehog? You can't play Sonic the Hedgehog, but you can play two other cartoon fighters from the Sonic fighting game, which is, which is really cool. And, and what's this? Like, you, you played the, the car from Daytona. Yeah, you, you get beat up by the car's tires and stuff. It's pretty hilarious. Uh, but, you know, it, it's, a, it's a fun game. It's the best fighting game, I think, for the Saturn. Um, I give it an eight and a half. 8.5, 8.5. Right, that's a decent score. Yeah, uh, I like the backgrounds. It's like you have all the backgrounds from like every Sega game. Yep. You have like Sonic the Hedgehog background. You have yep. the uh, Daytona track. Daytona track. And you get all the music from all the games and too. you can which choose to cool. have them walled in or have them not walled in. So, right. And there's no more ring outs. I couldn't stand the ring outs in the virtual fight. That was one thing I couldn't stand. Right. And there's none of that. But the coolest thing of all is that there's uh, the Virtual Fighter 3 moves are in there, so you can have the the, uh, the shift button does the dodge moves, and you've got all these extra little doodads that the characters do that uh, it just kicks. Now, it's me and you cool. played a little two-player tournament also, didn't we? Yeah. And do you want to tell our viewing audience out there who won? Yeah, I'll let you win. Yeah, oh! Because it's the first time that he played. Ah, oh, no, okay. They want to do so. Oh, no. He's the host, so. Yeah. What, what, uh, what'd you give the score? I, I'd give it a 9.5. 9.5? Yeah, it's excellent. What about Ultra 3D Mini Golf? Now Let's this, see. say, now this is a fun game. You got True Putt and Easy Putt. I liked True Putt, so you can actually, you know, you take the, you take the mouse and you boom like that. But it's, it's real easy. It's fun. It's graphically, it's nice. The sound was, was, was funny as heck. I, I, I loved it to death. 9.5. Wow. Yeah. Um, I agree with you. It's a nice, simple game. It's, it's, it's easy to play. It's definitely something that you could play uh, while you're at work and shut off quickly before your boss catches you. I think that's, a, that's pretty important. Um, but I don't know, I, I think I'd get bored of it. Especially playing by myself, I think I would get bored of it after about two or three times. It's only 20 bucks though, which is a pretty good deal. Um, yeah, I'd give uh, uh, Ultra 3D Mini Golf of a 7.5 out of 10. Yeah, well like, can we get out of here because it's like raining? Yeah, I'm getting soaked, let's go. And I got the most amazing thing to show you. Well, you know what? You're not going to see it till next week, so you better tune in. EP Tommy T, place to be. Production assistance for the Electric Playground was provided by Nintendo of Canada and Heat.net. My, my car keys are on your, on your jug. My car keys are on your desk. On your. This classic episode of the Electric Playground was brought to you by PNP Games, your source for everything video games. Support the partners that support the Electric Playground. Thanks for watching and play forever.